All right, I don't know, I got, uh, I don't know why it got uh, frozen. Okay, so, uh, then what we have, you know, I can put this one, I guess, on the, on this side. So, it's gonna be minus partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to time is equal to minus the, um, wait, it's just the total derivative of this H. Um, you can use the capital H if you want. The reason why they use uh, a small H rather than a big H is because the Hamiltonian is typically given in terms of the, um, the phase space. So you have <coughs> the, the position uh, coordinates and the momenta coordinates. And here it is given in terms of the generalized uh, coordinates, which is not standard. Um, but this still holds. Right, so th that is equation 2.54. So if the Lagrangian is independent of time, then <coughs> this thing is zero. So we get that the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to time is zero. And so the, um, the total, well, the energy H is conserved. So for the next part, um, I'm not gonna go into as much detail as I have in my notes. You can check my notes, but essentially, um, just like before, we divided the the kinetic energy. into T0, T1, and T2. And if you remember, uh, these terms were you know, independent These ones were linear in the... I have a, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, uh, could you give me an instance where the Lagrangian is independent of time? The Lagrangian what? An instance when the Lagrangian is independent of time. Like an expression where the Lagrangian is independent of time. An example? Yes, please, yeah. Um, for example, um the solar system right so you don't have the gravitational force changing like it is constant through time so if you somehow find a way to change the strength of the gravitational field that will make the lagrangian dependent of time um but if it's if it's always the same then uh, it's independent of time. So okay. whenever you know, you're not injecting energy into the system, so your system is isolated, then uh, the Lagrangian is independent. So you know the 
the relationship between the potential and the kinetic energy uh, might change, might be changing continuously, but you know the sum is constant, so then the Lagrangian is independent of time. Actually, it's you know, fairly common. Okay, so we had this kinetic energy that was independent, uh, linear in velocity, and quadratic in velocity. So we can do the same for the Lagrangian, although it's going to be a little bit um, more uh, constrained because uh, it's not just linear or quadratic, but it's actually going to be um, first degree homogeneous and second degree homogeneous. So if it's uh, homogeneous, it means that it has this form. L1, function of q, q dot, and time. If you multiply the velocity times r, So you have Q, um, R, Q dot, time, this is going to be equal to R, to the uh, exponent you know, 1, I guess we can remove it, and then L1, Q, Q dot, T. It has this property. If you multiply all the velocities times the linear term, you can take the linear term out and recover the original. It's just a multiplying. And if you do it for this, the ones that are second degree, Q, so this one will be um, multiplied times R, Q dot T, this is going to be r squared uh, L2 Q Q dot T. So the Lagrangian does have these properties. <coughs> oh, oh, please, I have a question. Yes. Yes. Um, why are we multiplying the, or why are we, yeah, why are we multiplying the multiplicative factor? Only the velocity. Why are you multiplying the velocity? Yeah, why are we multiplying the r only by the velocity? Because um, this is, we're looking at whether it is linear or quadratic in velocity. We're looking at the behavior uh, of the Lagrangian with velocity and whether we can separate the Lagrangian in independent, linear, and quadratic. So, first degree homogeneous equation, second degree homogeneous equation. So this is how you test. This is the definition of um, homogeneous equation of degree. Um, I guess we can put like a K over here. Um, I I was I I think I understand homogeneity to be like the multiplicative factor multiplies all the content of the function. Uh huh. Yeah, I understand how would you to be like the multiplicative factor as the R should multiply the two contents of the function L. Uh -huh. So, yes, please. So I, I kind of, I don't understand why the R should not multiply the 
the other contents of the function. You should multiply only the, the, the velocity. Um, well, it's what you're trying to test. So if you multiply the position times r, um, the Lagrangian is not going to be homogeneous in, in position. Um, it's only in velocity. Okay. You know, but uh, I guess the, the point of this is that, um, so I'm gonna leave this one here. The point is that because it is homogeneous, you can use um, Euler's homogeneous function theorem, which says that sum of i, xi partial derivative of f with respect to xi equals rf. So, you know, this is what we have over here. Um, so because he is uh, homogeneous in qj dot, and we don't have qj over here. So that's why we're not looking at qj. So um, because of that theorem, we can actually calculate this number. It's going to be um, for L zero, we just get a zero. For L one, you know, it's RF. It's going to be um, where is it? So H is this one? I'm gonna rewrite it. Sum of j, qj dot, partial derivative with respect to qj dot, l0 plus l1 plus l2. So we're putting the Lagrangian in these terms and minus the total thing, which is this one over here. Um, so now we're gonna use this theorem this is going to be equal to, you know, for L naught is going to be zero. For L one is going to be L one, and for L two is going to be two L two. Right. So oh, the, can the R be a fraction or the R is always a constant? Uh, R is the degree, yes. So this is like you know, second degree, right? Homogeneous. First degree, you can put the one over here. First degree homogeneous. Yes, it is a constant. Okay. So then this H is equal to L1. plus two L2 minus L. So this is equal to minus L zero, which we get from this one, plus L one, um, this one, minus an L one from here. And then for the L twos, we have uh, 2L2 um, minus this L2. So I'm going to continue up here. If it's time independent, then 
the um, kinetic energy is just going to be dependent um, quadratically on the velocity. So L naught <coughs> is minus V and L2 is T2 or T which is equal to T2. That means that H over here, um, well, I guess you can, it's minus L naught, this one's go away, and here you just have plus L2. So you substitute this one in here, it's going to be, um, well, this one is T, and this one is B. Right, so the Hamiltonian is equal to the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. And that comes from the fact that the Lagrangian is um, second, first degree homogeneous in QJ dot, in the velocities. <coughs> All right, let's move. Uh, to the next chapter very quickly. Chapters one and two are mostly about setting up things. And then um, chapters, the next chapters are mostly about applications using the setup um, from chapters one and two until we reach uh, chapter eight in which we're going to you know, develop some of the Hamiltonian stuff. But for the next uh, few weeks, it's going to be mostly applications. And of course, yeah, so this is, this is a nice result. Um, I guess historically, one of the most important topics has been uh, celestial dynamics. So we're going to look at the central force problem. Uh, where is this not working? I think I didn't get the relationship between H and the big H. Between what? The two H, like the small H and the big H. So small H, it was in terms of the generalized coordinates. You know, just because it's the way we were deriving it. But the Hamiltonian is almost, well, it's, it's not given in terms of the generalized coordinates. The Hamiltonian is given in terms of the, um, the velocity and the, the position of each particle and the momenta of each particle. So um, it's a called phase space. So for the, you know, we will definitely talk much more in detail about this later. Okay. So for the Lagrangian, uh, remember that we were in configurational space. So each of these are independent. With the Hamiltonian, uh, we're going to work in, uh, in phase space. So they don't have to be independent necessarily. Um, that's why the book makes a distinction here. You know, other than that, they are exactly the same. Okay. Yep. Okay. So let's look at this situation. We have um, a 
we have our origin over here, and this is vector capital R. Uh, let me see. So this vector is r from the origin to the center of mass of this um, rod, we can call it. Over here we have m1, over here we have m2. We have two masses. You can think about two planets or you know, the sun and the earth. This vector over here from the origin to mass one is small r one. And this one is small r2. Uh, this vector over here, r, small r, is r2 minus r1. This one minus this one, so it's this one over here. Because r goes from <coughs> <coughs> the origin to the center of mass R is given by um, M1 R1 plus M2 R2 divided by M1 plus M2 um, R, you know, we have it in there but let's rewrite it so that we don't forget. And we're going to assume that the forces are conservative, so the potential depends only uh, on R. And R is the distance between the two masses. Right, so the force or the the potential that they interact with, the force that they feel, depends only on how far away they are from the other mass. You know, this is an isolated system, it's the only thing that exists in a, in a, <coughs> in a uh, large space. So, uh, let's write down the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian of this system is the potential in the kinetic energy and the kinetic energy depends on R1 and R2 dot, right? And the potential, which is just R. The potential, um, The kinetic energy, we can put it in terms of um, R over here. So it's actually, we can put it in terms of big R and just R. And this makes things better because now we have R here and R here. So the potential energy is going to be one half of M1 R1 dot squared plus one half M2 R2 dot squared. So <coughs> Let's look at this construction now. If we put M1 over here and M2 over here, you know, the center of mass can be any, anywhere, let's say here. Then we can define two other vectors. Um, one that goes from here to here, another one that goes from here to here. 
This one is going to be called R1 prime. And it's given by M2 divided by M1 plus M2 R. Remember that R is this whole thing. And R2 prime is M1 divided by M1 plus M2. It's not visible, sorry. It is not visible? It's too light? Yeah. Or what is the, the problem? Should I use a different color? Yes, please. Okay. So I guess... Uh... Can you see the black over here? Yes. Okay, good. Uh... All right, so it's going to be monochromatic. <laughs> So R is this whole thing from here to here, and we're defining R1 to be this vector from M1 to the center of mass, and R2 is the vector from the center of mass to M2. So if you look at the limiting behavior, if M2 goes to infinity, then you will expect the center of mass to be where? If M2 goes to infinity, so it's extremely massive, what's going to happen to the center of mass? It's going to be on M2? It's going to be on M2. That means that um, R1 is going to be well, R1 prime is going to be M2 divided by M1 plus M2 M1 is negligible, M2 divided by M2 is 1, and so you have, as expected, that R1 is the whole thing. And in the other case, <coughs> M1 is negligible, so this is going to be 0, and so R2 is 0 because it is, you know, on the center of mass. So it has the behavior that we want. Um, so we can define now R1, which is this vector, as big R, so to the center of mass, from the origin to the center of mass, plus R1 prime, which is this one over here. So it's this one and then times this one, I mean, plus this one. And R2, similarly, is the center of mass plus R2 prime. Okay. So this one I'm going to leave it there. Uh, this one I'm going to get rid of. Uh, this one too. I'm going to put these ones up here. Good. <clears throat> so now we're going to write the <coughs> kinetic energy. going to be one half of M1 
and it's going to be r1 hat so we can write it as r plus r1 dot dot squared and the same thing for uh, r prime and the same thing for the second mass so m2 r big r r2 prime squared so we can just um, expand it this is going to be one half m1 So it's this one first. Yep. Uh, two R dot then the dot product um, R one. This is the first term, this one, and for the second one, we get something very similar. terms together this is just the algebra um, it's gonna look like this one half of m1 plus m2 we have the big R term squared and then we have um, m1 r1 squared One half and two r two dot squared, and then we have the dot product, so we can factorize it as r dot m one r one prime plus m two r two prime. So you can see in my notes, I'm not going to do it over here, that this term over here is equal to zero and it comes from the definition of the center of mass this one so you're going to have a term that looks like this they will cancel um, each other out so we can forget about this term and this is the the kinetic energy <coughs> So we can write it as, uh, this is prime. We can write it as one half M1 plus M2. And plus T prime. So we have the kinetic energy of the center of mass plus the kinetic energy of the movement about the center of mass. So we're going to use this definition mm. Mm, this one over here to rewrite everything in terms of um, R So R1 prime dot, 
Mm. Our one prime is n2 divided by m1 plus n2 times r uh, just from the definition uh, if we take the dot then this is the only difference and then if we take the square uh, this one becomes squared and this one too we can do the same thing for r2 prime squared um, so it's going to be in this case m1 squared m1 plus m2 squared r dot squared so we can substitute this in the um, in the kinetic energy I'm going to move the one half to the other side to make it a little bit more clear. So we're going to have m1 uh, m2 squared. So the m1 is the, you know, the, the mass of the part of the kinetic energy, right, of mass 1. And then this is the, the vector um, r1 hat, um, r1 prime. So it's going to be uh, m1, m2 squared, uh, m1 plus m2 squared, m2, m1 squared, and 1 plus m2 squared, whole thing divided by m1 plus m2 to the fourth and this is just function of r dot squared so we can cancel these ones this one becomes a squared so this is going to be equal to m1 M2, M2 plus M1 divided by M1 plus M2 squared. So now we can cancel this one with this one, R dot squared. And so the end, we end up with and we can move the two to the other side again. It's going to be one half m1 m2 divided by m1 plus m2 r dot squared. This is equation um, 3.4. It's the reduced mass. Which you have probably heard about. So you know the kinetic energy is just going to be one half of the reduced mass r dot squared, <coughs> which is a pretty neat result. So next time we'll see <coughs> that the, the kinetic energy that depends on R is actually a cyclic variable, so we can forget about it. And so the, this means that the central force motion of two bodies about their center of mass can always be reduced to the equivalent one body problem over here. We'll see that this is all the, the kinetic energy. And so the Lagrangian is going to be this.
All right, questions? <coughs> yeah, thank you for attending the uh, um, online class and